You're listening and watching Rashkin Report, and I'm your host, Yuri Rashkin. On this video, on this conversation, we will bring together here people that have not been together, yet they work together, worked for the same <clears throat> outfit called KGB. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled and excited by the opportunity to meet uh, under this set of circumstances, Jack Barsky and Yuri Schwitz. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. It's an honor. Yeah, Thank me you. too. It's my pleasure. It's going to be interesting. <clears throat> right? First of all, you have both worked in this uh, for the organization at the same roughly time during the 80s. So let's begin at the beginning. How did you um, integrate into the, well, in, how, were you, how did you become known to the, well, in, in Jack's case, uh, Stasi, um, in Yuri's case, uh, KGB. And, uh, and then we'll go from there. And one more thing that I would like to mention is if you would like to kind of have a community, conversation amongst yourselves. Don't let me stop you. I, I will be, be exciting to, you know, just be a part of this uh, conversation. So how did you get involved uh, with this type of work, Jack? Okay. Uh, I initially thought it was Stasi, but uh, after um, having had a chance to do some more background research, you know, in the last few years, I think I was I was directly recruited by the KGB. Um, the first the reason I thought it was Stasi, the first contact I had was uh, with a German speaking individual. But the KGB had lots and lots of uh, collaborators, and, uh, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, as much as we were supposed to be friends and brothers, uh, the East Germany and the Soviet Union, the Stasi and the KGB, there were some walls. The KGB recruited me. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a conclusion based on the fact the KGB recruited me initially to be sent to West Germany at a time when the Stasi had a thousand active agents, some of which in high levels of government in West Germany. So they didn't really you know, share too much. Uh, so anyway, I was recruited out of college and I believe uh, that same happened to, to Yuri. Uh, the, the KGB just as the CIA as typically recruited from the top. So I, I was a really good student and I was a party member and I bet you Yuri was similar. Well, as I recall, Yuri Tist was a very good student. I don't know, were you a, a party member? Myself? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I became party member when uh, I was on mandatory two year service in the Soviet armed forces. Uh, and then so when I joined the, the university, People's Friendship University in Moscow, I was already a party member and I was recruited by the KGB as a party member. Uh, essentially it was a must. I knew just one uh, cadet of the Red Banner Institute, meaning the spy school, who was not a party member, but he became the party member eventually. Um, but, the, you know, party membership, it was not like a seal of approval or perfection because the boss of the Communist Party uh, in our spy school, he was actually working for the CIA. He was recruited by the CIA when he was on a mission in Indonesia several years before that. And then he was made the chairman of the party committee at the Institute. Uh, meaning that he knew the identity of all cadets, of all students of the spy school, and he passed this information on to the CIA. So the CIA knew several years in advance who is coming, who will be stationed where. Well, um, let's see. What was the relationship between Germany and Russia? I mean, after World War II, when Russia, you know, was part of the winning team, um, Germans weren't like really in a high regard uh, culturally in Russia. And yet there's this, uh, you know, very strong relationship between the secret police. Um, how did that process, how did two, you know, you view each other because one is from Russia and one is, you know, from Germany. Is there some kind of a expectation uh, that way too? 
All right, if I, if I may, uh, because I know both countries reasonably well, spent two years in Moscow and obviously worked for Russians, uh, I think you may be a bit off. The, uh, the East Germany was admired by the Soviets because uh, we were technically more advanced in many respects. And we had this country, East Germany had to build back from scratch. Uh, there, there was some admir level of admiration for all things German amongst the uh, Russians. And that sort of started with Peter the Great. Um, and we, on the other hand, with the East Germans, we looked up to the Soviet Union as our savior and uh, the big brother and the one that eventually will lead the world uh, into uh, to to establish a workers' paradise. So so this was the romantic uh, confluence in the early '80s when I joined. This is what I believed, and this is what I heard. You know, it's interesting. You should say that because, on some level, yes, that brings back childhood memories of East German things being of higher quality and everything. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, Russians look down at like everybody. So, <laughs> so I was curious, uh, Yuri, from that point of view, is there? Um, uh, you know, somebody who works for KGB from Germany, is there any sort of a bias, any direction in your mind about that? Well, I, I support uh, Jack and what he said about the relationship between the two countries and the people. My in-laws, the father and mother of my wife, they were on uh, duty. They, they spent several years in Berlin in German Democratic Republic in the Soviet embassy. So I, I've heard about uh, a lot about Germany. Um, Germany was used as a country with established skills, you know, because they had had many, many decades, even centuries of capitalism experience. This is where you learn to do your job right. And Germans were perfect in this. Then don't forget, Everybody is saying, you know, that the Soviet Union will send the first man into space, etc. But a few people remember that it was thanks to German scientists who were taken out of Germany after World War II to Russia and to the United States. So American and Soviet space program were run by Germans on both sides. And it was competition <laughs> between different group of German scientists rather than Americans and the Soviets. And uh, the Soviet intelligence, KGB intelligence, had a very great respect to German intelligence. Um, their boss was like a brother to the leadership of the KGB. And Germans is, I mean, the uh, GDR, they had tremendous successes in espionage against primarily West Germany and especially the Department of Illegals. They can, you know, uh, sometimes in certain aspects, they were decades ahead of the Soviet intelligence in the 70s and the 80s. So. Yeah, if I may, if I may add to this, uh, first of all, uh, the head of uh, the Stasi uh, uh, foreign intelligence was Marcus Wolf, right. who, who spent the uh, several years during the war in the Soviet Union. His nickname was Misha, yeah. um, and he book, he 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 wrote a book called the the, the Troika. Um, anyway, uh, the, one of the reasons that they had great success, there were no there were no language and cultural differences between East and West. So um, preparing illegals uh, from uh, the stock of Russian citizens was very difficult, if not impossible. So that's why they uh, uh, the KGB reached out to foreign nationals such as me, or maybe even people out of uh, the Baltic republics, uh, people who would have an easier time. Uh, getting rid of uh, the, a very strong Russian accent, and this also the whole culture thing and so forth. Um, it's not to not to belittle uh, the Russian people. You know, I I have a great respect and love for the Russian people. I just can't stand the old government and the new government. Who can? Um, let's see. <laughs> 
Um, and your jobs were very different. Your job descriptions were different because uh, Yuri was a field officer, so he was out there actively working, and and Jack's I think, main job was not to be found. Um, so when you were getting trained, um, was there different things that you needed to learn? Uh, because I think Yuri, you spent more time at the spy school than Jack has. How was? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the training that you received? Uh, what was covered in in the curriculum? Now, Yuri, you want to start because I didn't have a curriculum. <laughs> well, the difference between us was that uh, I worked in a so-called legal residentura or legal station, meaning that we used uh, Soviet uh, organizations such as foreign ministry, different mass media outlets, trade. Uh, um, representative office. We use them. We use as, as a cover legal Soviet uh, offices in the United States. So it meant it meant legal residentura, and uh, our task was pretty straightforward. Uh, my primary task and the task of my colleagues at this station was not to miss the signs of preparation of the Pentagon to <clears throat> launch a sudden nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. And for this, you need information and to get information you need uh, to recruit somebody. So my mission was to look for potential recruits, uh, then develop them and recruit. That's what I was doing. Uh, my understanding was that the illegals they had entirely different uh, line of work. They are totally separated from one, from us. I can give you an example. At one point, I crossed my pass with illegal, with an illegal. I don't know who was it, but the story was like this. Um, Kruchkov, who was the chief of the Soviet and KGB intelligence at the time, sent a task to our station. And the task was, to attend and obtain information about uh, a conference, which included United States, some other NATO members, and China. It looks very suspicious, and the center wanted badly to know what was going on mm -hmm. there. So I was sent out to, to see if I can attend that conference taking place in DC. I went there. I was denied because I, I work under cover of task respondent, but I was not allowed. To, uh, to, to attend the conference. I started complaining that as a journalist, I'm a taxpayer, I'm paying taxes, you have conferences on my money, you're not allowing me. So uh, um, a young girl who was confused by my insistence, she said that, look, there is a small booth in the corner, look. There is a guy who is tape recording, our audio recording, everything which is taking place in the, at the conference. Go out and you can buy recordings. So I, I came to this guy, the guy was pretty interesting, sneaky guy, but it could be seen and I bought these uh, recordings. Then some of these recordings turned out to be in bad condition. <clears throat> I returned back to this office, to, uh, to, to the office where the recording was taking place. And I discovered a wealth of recordings of other Pentagon conferences, round tables, which is out of reach for our embassies. There are lots of, there were lots of Star Wars, um, different other Pentagon programs. <coughs> so I bought, bought a couple of them. We mm -hmm. sent a message to Moscow and I received a, a feedback cable from Moscow saying, stay away from this office. We directed our illegal to get in touch with this company and you know to acquire everything they have. But I never saw this illegal. Our station was not in touch with illegals at all. Uh, on the other hand, our station was running, was handling the most efficient, effective agents for the key working for the KGB at the time, such as uh, Walter, family, spiring, uh, then it was Aldrich Ames, then it was Bob Hansen, etc., etc. So my understanding was that for illegals at the time, the most important task was to settle, to blend in, 
and to wait, to wait for day X, you know, when they were supposed to be, <laughs> to be activated. I got a question for you. Uh, I, I, I was uh, located in New York. I had interaction, at least a, a direct, indirect interaction, at least a half a dozen times with uh, dead drop operations. Mm -hmm. And then there were signals. Uh, there was there were a signal spot where I could set a signal, and there were another spot where they could set a signal. So, so did you uh, participate in in that indirect communication with illegals? You you must have had illegals in, in DC as well. Yes, my understanding was that we had an illegal, but I do not believe that our station was in direct communication with them. We, we had a special guy who was in charge of looking for places for dead drops, uh -huh. <clears throat> for signals, etc. But at that time, those places for uh, communications, they were used primarily by the agents we were running, such as F Walker, you probably know this uh, um, famous uh, family of spies in the United States. Yep. So we were not communicating with um, illegals directly. And I have, I have a question for you. Um, how you were trained as an illegal? Where, where, were you trained just you and, and the coach? Or you were trained in a group of other uh, kinds no, of experts? Strictly one-on-one. -on -one. Oh. Now, uh, I got two years base training in Berlin, and then it turned out that... Uh, uh, I displayed uh, uh, a talent for acquiring in English, and so that I got two more two more years of training in Moscow, primarily because of uh, you know the, the need to perfect my English. Um, everywhere, everything that I learned, and I, I tell you one thing: the 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 tradecraft people were excellent. Uh, in in Moscow, I worked with. Uh, uh, surveillance people, they were just like off the charts, you know, the, the, the guy who coached me was was amazing. Uh, and at, at the most, there were three people in, in the room or on the street, because uh, a lot in Moscow, a lot of the technicians didn't speak uh, German or English. So I had a liaison. But other than that, mm -hmm. I was I completely isolated. And there, as I said, there was no real curriculum. It was ad hoc. Oh, well, now we're going to learn a little bit about that, that, that. There was no check marks, nothing. There was no structure to my training. And a lot of the training was, uh, uh, there was a lot of self-teaching in many respects, for instance, in English. But also, I had to, I, my, one of my tasks was to uh, expand uh, my knowledge of the world, culture, music, theater, museums, and all that stuff. And that was up to me. So I would become somebody who could operate at a, at a high level in society if that opportunity arose. We're trained in Moscow in uh, what they call the secret or conspiratorial uh, apartment. Yeah. Yes, yes. You were not trained in a special facility outside of Moscow, apartments? Not at all. Yeah, yes, yeah. I, I, I was in one of those apartments right. and they always came to me, right. always came to me, except for when it was the, you know, the surveillance uh, the training and counter surveillance in the streets. But other than that, it was always in, in, a, in one of those flats. Okay. You know, just kind of curious, because uh, <clears throat> Jack, I think you've mentioned in your interviews that, you know, being a spy and James Bond is nothing like the real work that you had to do. But at the same time, here you are being told to go to theaters and museums and, and be all social. And uh, and is, is there a line which you're not supposed to cross? You're just supposed to be invisible in that setting? You don't want to attract attention, I suppose? No, no. But, you know, they, they had a point. Uh, the plan for me was to really uh, become reasonably wealthy and then be able to, you know, mingle with uh, with with individuals uh, that are of a high enough standing that they really ha had influence or at least information. And and I proved to myself, my in my second year in in uh, in, uh, in New York. Uh, I, to make it really short, I had a love affair with a young lady who invited me to her, to her uh, mo mother's house in Washington D.C. for a diplomatic soiree, with pianist and everything, and it was in honor of the um, the um, 
the uh, cultural attache of Austria. And here I was mingling freely with them diplomats. So I knew I could, I could have done it. I was prepared, except I never got another chance. <laughs> Jack, may I ask you a question? Uh, were you tasked to prepare some analytical reports on different developments, political developments in the United States? Yes, I was to. Uh, I periodically sent reports on the opinions of the man in the street, you know, of the people that I interacted with. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, that was worth a little more than what uh, I believe. Uh, some of the folks that were in the embassy did to just uh, copied stuff from the New York Times and the Washington Post. <laughs> All right. Were you so, paid? Were you paid reasonably well for your work? Um, I was uh, when when I actually worked for money when I had a job. I was the uh, my salary was five hundred dollars a month, which we accumulated in Moscow on an account, which eventually grew to something like forty fifty thousand dollars. I never saw a penny of that. <laughs> Wait a minute. So, so you, the only money that you actually made from all of this work was the money you legally earned. Uh, yes, but you know, my in year two, I started my first uh, new career. I was a bike messenger in Manhattan, and and it was I made enough money in that job to rent an apartment and you know live like a normal person, and then after going back to college. And I, I could pay for college myself as well because I had an, an accident as a bike messenger. So I got some money out of that accident. And then I took a small student loan. And so I was self-sufficient after year one, completely. There was no more infusion of cash from, from Moscow. That's really interesting. They weren't trying to set you up with a business or anything. Yes, like that that was the plan. But but the, the plan failed and uh, I, I was... I was I, I got a, a bona fide documentation, a social security card, and driver's license, and then I was going to get a passport. And the plan was to then move to, let's say, Austria or Switzerland, and that's where they were going to set me up with a company where I would then come back within a couple of years with five million dollars. Uh, the the passport application failed miserably. Uh, I made a mistake. And Moscow made a mistake. We practiced what, what to put in the application. And uh, the person who looked at my application uh, saw some red flags and I was denied the passport. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that put a monkey wrench into, into my entire career. I would, have, I would have made a really, really dangerous illegal uh, because of uh, what I now know I could do uh, my ability to uh, to do well with people and having money, my God, is uh, thank I, I thank God that it failed because I'm so much more comfortable with the way things turn out. <clears throat> um, and that's that's my next question, gentlemen. How do you feel about the organization that you used to work for? It, you know, do you do you feel that this was uh, you know, an, an amazing thing, or do you think that this was a tragic experience? I mean, it's on one hand, you have your personal life when, when, when any healthy person like to think that what they did was the right thing to do. On the other hand, it's kind of, I think, hard to defend KGB. And, you know, if we're going to criticize government of Russia today, well, that's the same people. So um, how do you feel about KGB now? Um, I don't know, perhaps Yuri would like to, you would like to go first? Well, at that time, first, I separated the foreign branch of the KGB, meaning intelligence, from the rest of the KGB. I was working for the intelligence service. And if we go back to great purges of the cities, when they started, it was the KGB intelligence first, which was destroyed by domestic branches of the KGB. It was the start of the great purges. Then they took on uh, military, intelligence, etc. Uh, there was an iron curtain. So we knew about the West, about politics, only what we were told by our coaches, our gurus, our professors, etc. So when I, I remember when I just joined the Red Banner Institute, simply saying the spy school, I saw this big map of the Soviet Union on the wall, which was surrounded by United States. 
States and Allies military bases all across the border of the Soviet Union. And the message was simple. Look, guys, we're in mortal danger and it's up to you to protect the country. And I seriously, I took it seriously. I took seriously this mission until I came to the United States. It took me three months to realize that the task was funny. And I was amazed that most of my colleagues shared my opinion, not just in the KGB station, but even GIU station, etc. And with years, I realized that all these assignments, it was a bureaucratic plot. People at the Politburo, they were wrangling over power. It was a power struggle between different factions at the top of the Soviet leadership. And they used our intelligence agency to support their views, to support them in this wrangling. And just to note that to a large extent, the KGB intelligence and GIU, they turned into a misinformation machine supplying misinformation to the Kremlin because Kremlin was receiving from the intelligence what they wanted to receive. And eventually that's exactly what led to collapse of the Soviet yeah. Union. When I realized basically what, is, what was going on yeah. and I fully realized that by the year 1990, a year before collapse of the Soviet Union, I resigned. I was, it was a shock. I was just upset and I resigned. So that was my story. Jack? <laughs> I, I can relate to a lot of things that Yuri just said, uh, even though I wasn't in it, but I observed it from a distance and, and drew my own conclusions. Uh, in, in East Germany, we had the same thing. Uh, information that went up to the government was filtered multiple times until the government got what, what they wanted to hear. And when they got something they didn't want to hear, they just ignored it. So that, again, that's how the German Democratic Republic fell apart. Uh, and, and the same thing happened uh, at, uh, with the disaster in Chernobyl, right? It was, the, yep. uh, it, was, it, it was a dysfunctional hierarchy. Now, again, when I signed up, uh, the KGB was uh, nothing but heroes to me. I didn't know at all about the gulags. I didn't know about the internal repression. We knew that Stalin was evil, but uh, details were not uh, provided. And we didn't quite realize that Khrushchev served under Stalin many, many years. So, so that this whole system was corrupt, even post-Stalin. Uh, none of that was n known. Uh, we had some heroes, for instance, Richard Sorge, Richard Sorge, who was uh, a German who uh, spied for the KGB in Japan and was actually executed. And there were a few others that we knew about. So when I was recruited, it was like, wow, it was like the greatest thing that could happen to you. The KGB wants you? That was, to me, that was the most powerful organization on the planet at the time. Uh, throughout my training, I didn't really lose confidence. That that happened much later, and in hindsight, uh, I I told you that the operational people, the the ones that taught spycraft, were really good. They were some of the best. Uh, the folks that trained me were supposed to train me culturally uh, to prepare me to be an American were complete failures. They had. They had no clue. I mean, here's the thing, for instance, we, uh, I, I got this birth certificate uh, uh, that uh, made me the son of a uh, Elisha Lee Barsky, that's an Orthodox Jew, and, uh, and, and a Beatrice Schwartz, which could be Jewish or German, so we made her German. But for crying out loud, we never even considered the question, if somebody had asked me, what faith did you grow up in? In those days, in the in the forties, fifties, that was everybody was in some way religious in the United States, and I would have drawn a blank for an answer. So there were a lot of a lot of problems. One more I would like to mention: uh, I received uh, a couple of videotapes with uh, movies in English that were done in the United States 
in the 30s and 40s, in those days, they spoke uh, stage English. But crying out loud, they should have taped soap operas and given that to me. So I could really learn. Soap operas uh, uh, have much more language that is uh, more real, real life-like and, uh, and just normal. So there, I had to learn very carefully uh, in the first couple of years there, I had no interaction, uh, no close relationships. I had to very, learn very carefully by myself to, uh, to get an understanding what it's like to be an American. And one more thing, the one thing I, I, I shed very, very late, I was already out of the KGB. It's my, uh, my, my communication style, which is, uh, I spoke English perfectly and uh, with a very little accent, but I spoke it like a German, in your face, uh, um, harsh criticism out loud and so forth, until a friend of mine who was uh, originally from Cuba told, sat me down and said, hey, Jack, everybody thinks you're an asshole. <laughs> and, and then I started thinking, why? And I realized that, I, you know, I had, the Americans are much more softer and, the, and they're not as direct. So, so that was the sort of the last thing that, uh, that was a vestige of uh, my heritage. So I was well prepared in one, on the one hand and not well prepared on the other. Am I, uh, am I regretful that I joined the KGB? And the people ask me this all the time and I'm saying uh, I, what I knew then uh, made it a, a good decision. What I know now, made it not, not such a good decision, but it turned out okay. I think I was able to, whatever damage I did, and, and I have no idea uh, that, that feedback I never got, uh, whatever damage I might have done, uh, I think I, I counter, countered by uh, contributing in a major way to American society the uh, 40 years I had a, uh, a career in corporate America. Jack, I wanted to ask you a question that uh, I think I get asked a lot, which is how do you assimilate? This is a question for immigrants that you had to professionally address. Uh, you know, how do people become Americans if they if they want to become Americans? What what suggestions? Like, I think watching soap operas is, is one of yeah, them. Uh, and uh, just paying a lot of attention, you know, listening, uh, observing. Uh, because you know I'm a uh, I'm a very good observer, uh, and I, I notice lots and lots of things, little things, and and then you need to actually internalize this stuff. Um, for some people, it's easier. Uh, I think there is a uh, there's a little bit of uh, um, a nature versus uh, uh, nurture qu uh, quality. Nature is is important. I have a good friend friend who used to work for uh, naval intelligence in the United States. And uh, once him and his wife and me and my wife went together and the two wives agreed that they never know who will show up on any given day, depending upon who we interact with. So we have this ability to, you know, slip into a different personality based on who we're talking with. And that is something that you probably don't learn. So I guess the, the best, you, you, it's a certain amount of talent, I suppose. I, I absolutely, I believe it. But then you need to do something with that talent. You need to pay attention uh, and, and then internalize this. You know, I, I, I suppressed to the extent I knew it, everything German in me. So for instance, I cannot translate back and forth. If, if you were to throw a German phrase at me right now, I would stop uh, for a while. I would. I wouldn't find English words anymore because it's a different part of my brain. Is that a matter of survival to try to suppress that? Absolutely. You know, you, you don't want to wind up in an operating room and then, uh, you know, you go under and then you <laughs> start speaking German. Well, in that case, how were you able to get out of this uh, situation? Because KGB is not known as a place that's easy to quit. Um, and, and you both did it at the time when the country kind of the Soviet Union fell was falling apart. So maybe that's part of it. But, you know, how were you able to exit and how do you feel living today still having that, uh, you know, in your background? Are there retired KGB agents, as the saying goes, you know? I just want to say, Yuri, uh, what you did is uh, incredibly courageous. I mean, to get out of that organization 
And I don't know when you published your book, but you know, it's it's a miracle that you're still alive. <laughs> well, I resigned in 1990. People were already in the streets of Moscow. It was a full-fledged democratic movement. The KGB was an underdog already to a large extent. People in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, they were disarray. They were in near panic. So it was a time when no one had a grip of power on power in the country. And this is what saved me actually. Had I resigned two years ago, just one, even one year ago, they would have sent me into a lunatic exile because I wrote in my report that I'm resigning in protest against political <laughs> line of the KGB leadership period. And I was fired in 24 hours, usually it takes at least six months, you know, medical examination, different paperwork, etc. I was fired without 24 hours and I was free to go. Besides, there was already an independent entire government mass media in the country. Uh, and I, with my background as a journalist, using this as a, as a cover, I said that I'm going to get involved in journalism. And again, it made my former bosses a little bit apprehensive to do anything about me. And as far as the book is published, well, uh, uh, I know what they can do, but most importantly, I know what they cannot do. So I'm always on full alert, but I'm not paranoid. I take uh, reasonable precautions. And, but I lost a colleague. I had a partner in business, Alexander Litvinenko, who was poisoned with polonium in London. I had another partner. Uh, it's not related to Russia, but still, I had another partner in business, Bob Levinson, veteran of the FBI, drug enforcement agent who was kidnapped by Iranians uh, many years ago. So, uh, well, this is a choice. Once you made a choice, you have to, to live within the lines, you know, <laughs> of what, what you choose. I, I do not repent. I never look back. And I'm happy where I am at this point. I wouldn't have made, looking backwards, I wouldn't have made different decision at the time because I believe, still believe that I was right and my family members supported me and still support me in this. Can you disclose your location? Uh, not far from DC. I'm living okay. in, Virginia, in Virginia. I, I, uh, I'm sure I'm going to have occasion to... Uh be up in the, in the DC area again, I'd like to meet. Yeah, I'll be happy to, I'll be happy. Okay, all right. So un, unlike Yuri, when I resigned, I was completely in the dark. It was 1988. I was still under the impression that uh, uh, everything was going pretty well in the communist camp. There was no indication to me because I, I, I wasn't, uh, every two years I spent uh, like two, three weeks in, 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 in Moscow and in East Germany. Uh, I didn't have a clue what was going on. Uh, so in, in 88, to me, I had to come up with a lie. I couldn't have just have said I resigned. That would have been total betrayal. So I, uh, I came up with... Uh, and people think that was the most brilliant lie ever. I came up, came up with this uh, lie that I had to contracted HIV AIDS. And uh, at the time they, they, <clears throat> they called me back and I, I didn't want to go back and I said, geez, I got AIDS and uh, they believed it. They had no reason not to believe it. Uh, the, the one thing I was in the dark, but they were also in the dark about me. Uh, they did not ever check on me. They did not check as to whether you know I was telling them the truth. They uh, because if if you if you're like somebody like Yuri and then goes uh, trying to find out what's going on with one of our illegals, you just lead the counterintelligence right to the illegal. So I knew for sure that whatever I told them, they would believe. And I had a really good track record of uh, of telling them the truth, even when I didn't have to and uh, earlier. So uh, and. Uh, and so a year later, I watched the wall come down. And then another year later, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. And I said, oh my God, what happened? 
And I, it, I had to do some studying to figure out what I didn't know and how both systems were bound to fail from the beginning. So, <laughs> and so I was really lucky to, uh, you know, decontaminate very slowly. You know, I, I, I started building a life in the United States and I studied and I studied, and now I am as anti-communist as it gets. Communism is evil. That's a long, that's a long journey from way left to at least in, in this in, uh, philosophically far right. Jack, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, how you were exposed by uh, the FBI? Was it an act of treason in Moscow or the FBI actually did their job well fi and finally came across? The, the FBI, no, it, uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, you you familiar with uh, um, uh, Vasily Mitrokin? Yes. He had some information about me in his notes. <laughs> I would never believe that because you know who he worked in our archives. Yes, the KGB. Mm -hmm. You you put a file. You 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 sent a file and file to archives which you will never need. You never sent a, a, a valuable case file to archives. <laughs> Only trash. So oh well, they could yeah how they could. Deposited your case file. That, that, information in archives is beyond my imagination. That is interesting. I tell you what. Uh, what he what he knew. He knew he had some information about my early years. Uh, he knew that uh, there was a Jack Barsky and as an illegal living in the United States, he had uh, one convenience, uh, two convenience addresses. In the early, I sent my letters with secret writing, one to Berlin and one to Vienna. And that was about it. He didn't have any more. Uh, he, he, but he, he apparently uh, um, saw the entire file, and he said it was uh, six, five, six, seven thick binders. Mm -hmm. So that, it's amazing you're telling me that that, that stuff didn't belong there. <laughs> Absolutely, especially about illegals. Uh, th that is great because this is another one of those. Uh, uh, you know, cases of dumb luck, because I was, in hindsight, it was so great for the FBI to find me so I could finally live like a normal human being and not have to hide uh, anything about me. <clears throat> were, you, were you glad that, in some level, that you were discovered? Not right away. No, initially I was concerned. Um, because I was, I was afraid that, uh, you know, I, I still might wind up in jail. Uh, and uh, that my family would be, uh, I had a wife who I made legal, but she was an illegal alien out of South America so that she might get sent back and my kids would wind up orphans. Uh, the FBI had from, from day one something else in mind. Uh, they, they didn't disclose that, but you know, if I cooperate, I, I would uh, eventually uh, be allowed to be a free man. And that, 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 that sort of gelled after four, five weeks of debriefing, after I passed the lie detector test, that was important. And uh, at that point, uh, my, uh, my liaison, FBI liaison, and I sat down and he said, so we're gonna find a way to make you legal. It took a long time. Uh, the FBI is just as bureaucratic. <laughs> and, <laughs> Anyway, is there an important message to if there's other illegals uh, that are curious about what might happen <laughs> if they're revealed? And what you're saying is the government actually may be interested in making a deal. Is, is that like that or is that, that wrong? Or? Without a doubt, uh, uh, we have uh, people in the witness protection program that have killed others. Uh, it is the greater good, and in a situation as with intelligence, and, and Yuri disagree with me, if if you will, uh, uh, it is always better to either turn an agent that you uh, uh, be, become aware of, or at least debrief them and have them cooperate, because it, it, that is much more important than putting them in jail. Why? You know, that's revenge. What What are you getting out of it? Nothing. Zero. You're just spending money to keep the person in jail. 
No, but besides, it, besides, it's my understanding that you did not actually do anything illegal, anything bad against the United States, right? They had no proof, correct. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and the only thing that they had on me was that I was illegal. Yeah. Uh, I, I did some things that could have, uh, you know, I, I, I operated as a spotter. You know, people that, you know, I pointed out people that might be recruitable. And, and I did steal some software, but that was from a private company. <laughs> By the way, about Spotter, may I ask you a question? Did they ever ask you to focus on there was an electronic store in Manhattan run by Russian immigrants? They established this in this early 70s. Did the center ever ask you about this electronic store? No. I was given very, very little information uh, about anything. Uh, it, it was just uh, as much as they thought I needed to be operational. Uh, what, what could be an assignment? I had some special assignments. I, uh, I once was asked to uh, find, um, uh, now I forgot for the moment the name. Uh, Rosinski. No, 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 no. This is what it was a, a, uh, it was um, a, a very, very early defector from the KGB who, who uh, uh, was a hero in, during World War II as an assassin. And, and he defected and uh, wound up in California. Um, and and they, they asked me to f find if uh, a Nikolai Koklov uh, oh, okay. still lived there. And I found him. And this was a bizarre moment. Because you know he he taught at the uh, University of California uh, in the, in San Bernardino, and I'm going into the university. I walk down the hallway, and at the very end, I see an, a, a sign on the on the door, Kokloff. At that moment, the door opens, and a guy walks out. So we had a situation where an active KGB agent uh, crossed eyes with somebody uh, who who had defected and was still under a death sentence, neither one of us knew at the time who we were. <laughs> I found out later. Uh, so, so I had some special assignments. Uh, and I also, since you, were, you, you, you mentioned Ames, they had some plans for me to possibly act as a go-between mm -hmm. and, and uh, get the material that he, that Ames typically left for people like you, like, uh, you know, yeah. people who work for the embassy or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they never, they even asked me to find a spot up there in New Hampshire for uh, where a sizable object could be deposited, but they never went through with this. And, and Ames wound up being uh, filmed, you know, doing a dead drop operation. So that, that was the most dangerous part of, of, of his action that uh, interaction with, with the resident tour on. So, so there, there were some things that uh, I could have done and, and was asked to do. How they would have broken the law? Probably not. Jack, were you like working full? I mean, because you had a full time job. Oh, yeah. So was being a spotter and a illegal for KGB? Is that like one assignment a month, one assignment a year? No, no, no. There was no specific assignments. The, 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 uh, Every time I was in Moscow, they would uh, say contacts. We need more contacts, more contacts. Well, you know, if you work full time in information technology, that's a pretty damn demanding job. <laughs> that, that is nights and weekends. So, you know, I had colleagues and then I had a few friends, but I couldn't just go out and mingle with uh, folks that uh, w were operational in arenas that were of more interest than the IT people. So eventually, it, it was maybe uh, eight years into my assignment in, in, in New York that I really was annoyed having to do spy work because I, I liked the IT work better. I wonder, by the way, being in IT, wasn't that like super useful? Because, I mean, hackers are all the rage now. Yeah, that in those days, the, the, the KGB had no clue about the value of data. And I to give you this one example. I worked for <clears throat> MetLife Insurance, and I had access to the health uh, records of um, approximately 15 million Americans. And some of them were working high-level uh, executive at uh, 
at uh, armaments uh, factories, uh, military industrial complex. I told them, and they didn't blink. They didn't. They didn't even. They didn't bite at all. Uh, that changed radically nowadays. You know, there's a lot of focus on on uh, uh, technology uh, in Russian intelligence. You know. Again, you know, there was a level of cluelessness that in hindsight, you, you think, my God, uh, they were, the KGB was totally overrated. Yuri, were, were you overrated? <laughs> <laughs> well, my book, my actually the book I published in 95, it's about this, about, <laughs> uh, yeah, to a large extent, you know, they were, the KGB, to my mind, they radically changed somewhere in this late 70s, in the early 80s. I was trained in the spy school by the, what I would say, what called the heroes of the Cold War, mm. uh, who worked in the 30s, even in the 30s and 40s, 50s. This, they, those guys, they were legendary. And they were real masters. They were artists in what they were doing. Either this is recruitment or external surveillance or communication, whatever it is. The ideology, ideological motivation is another thing, but they were, they were brilliant uh, in what they were doing. But under Leonid Brezhnev, and then it continued later on, Bureaucratic things became more important than the trade craft. So your relations with your boss was the key for promotion. We started having generals who did not recruit even a fly, you know, not to mention an agent in the United States. Uh, advancement did not depend on your performance anymore. So it was a mess. This is something like happening in Russia these days, you know. And eventually it, it leads to collapse of the country because professionals do not matter anymore. You have other red tape, you know, reasons for promotion. So it was, I was on this threshold where old professionalism was met by bureaucratic uh, incompetence. And, I, and I, I agree with that. As a matter of fact, uh, I was trained by two Americans who participated in the theft of uh, uh, the nuclear secret, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Morris and Lana Cohen. Oh. Yes, and, and you know, I, I spent a lot of time with these two guys, uh, uh, and and so that that were that were the folks of the prior generation. They also spent some time in, in England with the Conan Melody, uh, mm -hmm. and and he he was excellent as well. Yeah. But but but, but that excellence disappeared, and and I think you're right about the, the bureaucratic nature. The organization got too big, so you in order to uh, to <clears throat> make progress, you you took no risks. You just uh, became very political. Mm -hmm. So is this like another monopoly gone bad because there was yeah. no, no competition? Okay. S sorry, sorry for, for talking over you. You're exactly right. It's the nature of large organizations that they eventually become dysfunctional. Yeah. yeah. Well, in intelligence, it's uh, like a litmus test. The bigger, the, the larger organization is, the less competent and efficient it is. So it's a rule of thumb. So if, you, if I'm asked, who is better, the Mossad or the KGB was, I would tell you Mossad, because Mossad, uh, I read some books of the form of Mossad officers. They said that in their Latin American sections, they had just two guys working on the entire Latin America. Wow. In our headquarters, in the second, the political intelligence branch only, we had uh, second, second department. We were the first department, there was a second, Latin America. We had more than 50 just in political uh, intelligence branch at the headquarters, not to mention those who were uh, in, in, on assignment uh, in those countries. So 50, just at headquarters and two, who is more efficient? I can tell you right away, two, because they know what they're doing. They're not bullshitting with useless paperwork. They're doing their jobs. That's simple as that. Yeah. 
Gentlemen, I'd like to ask you before we are done, but I'm glad to continue this as, as long as you're able to, uh, do you feel that the jobs that you have been doing are kind of antiquated and don't really exist? It's like horse riders. I don't know. There's, there's a time and place for that, but not quite because we get probably more information with hackers than we would get with, uh, you know, elite, one illegal, two illegals. And um, as Yuri Shvetsk has mentioned in the past, uh, the problem with Russia intelligence was they didn't have large immigration that they could have tap into diaspora now they can so they don't need so much field officers is is uh, are, are you like relics of the past i think i am uh but the the uh, romantic notion of the value of the illegals survived i mean <laughs> the uh, uh putin still talks uh, and and great verbiage about the, the wonderful illegals and we are the only ones that ever had successful illegals well my, my contingent there were 10 of us pretty much succeeded in very much nothing uh, other than scaring the americans because there could be so many 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 more um but the one thing i want to make sure that uh, i uh, uh, i communicate uh, the value of human intelligence is still critical. As long as people make decisions, it is important. It, it, it is the, the, the crown jewel of intelligence is to find out what's in the head of a decision maker. And you can't get this via hacking. Right. Yeah. Well, I remember at the same, uh, at the spy school, uh, we had a professor who compared CIA with the KGB intelligence. He said that CIA relied more on technical signal intelligence, yep. electronic intelligence, while we relied on human intelligence. And the difference was that, according to this colonel, he said that with electronic intelligence, you can find out how many missiles are deployed and where they are deployed on the enemy territory, targeted on your country. But mm. you can find out if and when they're going to be launched if you penetrate human brain, the heads of those who are in charge of those missiles. And for this, you need human <clears throat> intelligence, you know. But it should be, you know, you, you, you need to have people not like Putin, because he is nuts. He never worked in intelligence. But <laughs> That's right. It's a popular myth. This, this is the reason he doesn't understand what he's talking about. You know, you need just professionals to 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 direct to run those intelligence agencies to make sure that they're efficient rather than they're overblown behemoths who are not good for for, for not good for anything. Jack, I'd like to ask you though, what is your opinion of Putin and his statements about his career? How does it, how do you view it with your experience? Um, well, I know I know where he was uh, during the Cold War. Uh, he he operated in the in the city of Dresden, and there there was no action happening in the city of Dresden in East Germany. Exactly. The action the action was in Berlin in uh, uh, in in Vienna, maybe even in in in. Uh, and Istanbul, some other big, and, and of course, London, uh, there was nothing. He was a mid-level bureaucrat. And uh, Yuri, I don't know if you met uh, uh, Oleg Kalugin. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Well, so the, and, and Oleg uh, was at once, uh, one time was uh, Vladimir's boss. And Oleg, right. Oleg was not very impressed with, <laughs> with Vladimir. So uh, what I can say is uh, unabashedly that he is arguably the most successful politician in the last 100 years. How he managed to stay in power so long when the country around him at best stayed the same, but uh, at worst actually got worse. All right, gentlemen, the one question I, I guess I'd like to end with is uh, kind of the silly topic of right and wrong. Um, a lot of my conversations with Russian speakers uh, kind of go into the direction of professionalism. Russians tend to really value quality work. And, and I see that Yuri is a, you know, is a quintessential professional, and so are you, Jack. You have a master's degree in chemistry. I mean, you're a high-level, precise kind of guy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, this whole freedom and America and liberty, a lot of it is, is uh, hangs on what people consider the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. And, and Russians over the, the history seems to have kind of moved either like past that or, or something like that. And the idea that this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do is just not really part of the how to do something well. And, and I was curious if you had any thoughts on, on that dynamic and dichotomy. Yuri? Well, I'm not sure that I understood your question. <laughs> are you talking about Russia or the United States? I'm talking about people who are um, technically, you are not doing the right thing. You're, you're spying against uh, mm-hmm. this other country, <clears throat> uh, whether you're doing it as a field officer, whether you're doing it as illegal. Right. I mean, this is not, it's a nice, no, yeah, nice look, thing to do. You're doing, according to the laws of your country, you're doing the right things. So you're not violating the laws of your country. So you are uh, in perfect balance. You're, you're doing uh, well the uh, job for the right reason. Now, the, the, the question is whether you are violating the laws of the host country. And this is a subject of your professionalism. For instance, as Jack explained to you, he didn't violate uh, American law when he was here as an illegal. Mm. Neither I did. This find out because when I was approached by the FBI when I moved to this country, the first question I was asked whether I ask any of my sources to obtain and pass me on classified information. Mm. Had I did it, had I told the FBI, yes, I did, period. This is this is a criminal case on me. But I never did. You know, so <laughs> operating in this country, I never crossed the line of the law. Everything I was doing, it was along the lines. And these lines are pretty broad in this country, you know. In order to put a guy for an espionage in this country, you need essentially to caught, could catch him red-handed on an operation such as a dead drop with a bunch of classified information yep. on one hand and with with uh, thousands of dollar bills in another hand, you know? Otherwise it's mission impossible. So the lines, the are pretty blurred in this country where the uh, legal activities end and um, uh, espionage starts. So, I mean, it does require special professionalism to do something <clears throat> useful and not to cross the line. Um, if I may extend this, I have about a half a dozen really good friends who used to be in intelligence in the United States, CIA, FBI, uh, not NSA, but also naval intelligence. And we all agree on one thing, no matter what side we were on, we respect the other side's professionalism. And as long as we did not do what we did for personal gain, but we did it for a cause we believed in, uh, we're fine with each other. You know, that's that's typically uh, the uh, uh, the response that I get. Uh, not not condemnation for, for doing what I did because I believed in the cause, and you know I was misled. So now you can extend this and make this into a bigger philosophical question: How do you know what's right or wrong? Uh, then you get into the realm of philosophy, a moral compass, and possibly religion. And I think this is beyond the. Uh, uh, purview of, of this this the podcast. All right, then I'd like to give you just an opportunity to ask each other any questions you have, and uh, I don't know, uh, Yuri, if you'd like to go, if you have. Well, any... basically, I asked the questions I wanted to. That's all right, yeah. and me me too. But uh, I would uh, appreciate it. Uh, we we really clicked here. We we we. <laughs> I was really surprised to, that, that we like. It was a great, great idea for, for you to put us together. It is, I think that's the best uh, interview I've ever given about, you know, my role in the KGB, uh, because you get the other side. And uh, when and for, for old time's sake, maybe we'll do a, like a secret meeting with a, uh, you know. A, brush contact, brush contact. Oh, it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I hope that you will also consider meeting here again. This was great fun. Thank you so much. And right. I want to thank 
uh, Jack Barsky, who is also an auth author of a book, uh, Deep Undercover, and Yuri Schwetz, who is most recently featured in book American Compromise uh, by Craig Unger. And uh, you're watching Rashkin Report. Remember to subscribe, hit like, you know, all those good things. And, um, well, you know, until we meet again, take care, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice to see you.